Our final speaker is another outstanding member of our own faculty, uh, Omar Yagi, you have heard him mentioned already. Omar received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Omar is presently the James and Nellie Treader Chair, Professor of Chemistry and a senior faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He is widely known for developing several classes of remarkable new materials, including metal organic frameworks, or MOFs, covalent organic frameworks, or COFs, and zeolitic imidazolate frameworks, or altogether now, ZIFs. He is also the founding director of the Berkeley Global Science Institute, whose mission is to build centers of research in developing countries and provide opportunities for young scholars to discover and learn. Andy is the co-director of the Kavli Energy Nanosciences Institute, focusing on the basic science of energy transformation at the molecular level, and the California Research Alliance by BASF, otherwise known as CARA, supporting joint academia industry innovations. Omar is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he has been honored with many awards for his scientific accomplishments including the Wolf Prize in Chemistry in 2018, which is one of the highest awards in chemistry besides the Nobel Prize, which, who knows, maybe next. Omar's ChemEx talk today is entitled Chemistry Designs for Clean Energy and Water Harvesting from Air. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, these are some of the smallest molecules known, but these are the molecules that are part of the problem of climate change and sustainability, and they're also part of the solution. The first one is hydrogen, which is the cleanest fuel because it burns cleanly and only water is produced. The second one is methane. Two thirds of uh, fossil fuels on our planet are really in natural gas, and most of natural gas, over 90% of it, is methane. And it's the least utilized fossil fuel, although it is already uh, a problem in terms of uh, as, a, as a greenhouse gas. So CO2 is, we already heard, it's a problem and it's causing havoc in, on our planet. And water is another problem that Sometimes we hear about, but it's, a, it's one of the biggest problems facing our planet. Um, there are many regions of the world that have scarce water and other regions of the world that have water, water is not, uh, is not clean. So what I wanna tell you today is that we have invented a class of materials where we invented a, a new chemistry and new materials from that chemistry that can manipulate these gases and one of the things you all know is that gases occupy very large volume. So in order for us to make a hydrogen storage material or a, use hydrogen as a fuel or trap methane uh, and use methane as a fuel or trap CO2, you need to create um, materials that can compact them so that they can occupy smaller, smaller volume. So, new chemistry, new materials, and that has been leading to new solutions as my colleague, Professor Reimer, has alluded to. Uh, this new chemistry is reticular chemistry, reticular from net-like. So these materials are, they look like nets, and uh, we defined it back in 2003 as the chemistry of linking molecular building units. Molecular building units because we want to design this was a challenge in, in, uh, in chemistry in general of making materials and strong bonds so that they are robust materials that can stay, let's say, in a power plant year after year without having to cause another environmental problem of disposing uh, these materials. And then uh, they are also crystalline so that we know exactly where all the atoms, the constituent atoms and molecules are in the structure. So this. Uh, this chemistry has yielded one of the uh, classes of materials, as uh, Professor Doug Clark just mentioned, metal organic frameworks. And metal organic frameworks are composed from metal oxide units linked covalently or through strong bonds to organics to make extended structures. These are 
solid state materials. They're, they look like white powders. In this case, it's a zinc, so it's a, it's a nice white powder. And the yellow ball indicates the space within which one can compact the gases that I have uh, mentioned, mentioned earlier. The nice thing about these materials is that they're really a combination of metal oxide units, which are found in minerals, and they are combined with organic. And the organic part gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, fashioning the pores so that you can selectively remove, let's say, carbon dioxide from a mixture of gases. If your eye can see a MOF um, molecule structure, you would see something like this, where you have the metal oxide units act as junctions linking organic units here in triangular shape to make an extended structure, an infinite uh, structure that has uh, many, many openings. The nice thing about these structures that is not found in any other chemical structure is that the pores have no walls. They're really scaffoldings. So they have extremely uh, high surface area and gases can bind to, the, to these exposed surfaces, internal surfaces. So many thought that these would not be very stable because they are very open, but indeed uh, they are not just architecturally robust, but also thermally robust. They can be heated up to 300 degrees Celsius or 400 degrees Celsius without decomposing. And they are also chemically stable. So we can make them so that they can be, they can sustain water, even, even boiling water, acids and bases. And that's the kind of material that you need in order to, let's say, have a hydrogen storage material that would be in an automobile and that can stay in the automobile for the lifetime of the automobile or a material that would be in a power plant that traps carbon dioxide, releases carbon dioxide year after year after year. And the very nice thing about this chemistry is that even after those many years, when, let's say, the MOF stop functioning, you can add very strong acid and separate the metallic units from the organic and reassemble that same material, or if you like, other materials. So it's a zero discharge process which we have been developing over the last 20 years. So just to give you an idea of how porous they are, one gram of a moth has 10,000 meter squares. That's basically the footage of one gram. One gram is not very much more than this, this size. And so if I was to really unravel this to its molecular porosity, it will cover an entire football field. And that's how much space is trapped within a porous granule of, this, of these moths. So um, the nice thing about the moths is that they can be made as crystalline materials. So they are well formed. And we know exactly where all the constituents are. And furthermore, we can go in and modify them so that you can vary the inorganic units and the organic units. And you can see here, this is a very porous structure. And the idea is, could we take those gases I've been talking about and compact them into the pores? Now, the way we compact them into the pores, let me just show you, for example, for hydrogen. Hydrogen outside, let's say, the moth would like to repel each other, right? That's why they fill a very large volume. But in the MOF, we create sites onto which hydrogen can be attracted. And you can see here how the hydrogen molecules are being compacted on the internal surface of the material, almost like bees on a honeycomb. And, and that's the sort of strategy that is only possible through this chemical designs that, uh, that, have produced, that have produced moths. So based on this principle, we have designed moths that take up hydrogen. And Mercedes has uh, become interested in this and has used in this demonstration model uh, hydrogen under very high pressure, uh, but in a, in a tank filled with moths. Right now, moths can store up to 2% by weight 
hydrogen at room temperature. So that's interesting. Not yet at the level that it would have a wide, uh, wide applicability for automobiles, but definitely that's a very good start and it's made possible by these, by these materials. Now methane storage, methane is just as hard to store as hydrogen, maybe slightly easier, but definitely it's a big challenge. But that challenge has been completely solved by MOFs. Here's an automobile that is outfitted with a MOF fuel tank, and this automobile can store three times the amount of methane than a tank, than the same size tank, without the MOF. Now you can see the power of compacting those methane molecules into the, into the pores. And like I said, this can stay, the MOF can stay in the automobile for the lifetime of the automobile. This has been completely tested. In fact, it's been tested around the world in all the continents to make sure that it operates even from variously, uh, uh, various uh, sources of natural gas in various locales around the world. So the problem of methane capture and methane use uh, has uh, is solved with this, uh, with this development. Now, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned, here's a MOF. This hexagonal ring shows the pore of this MOF. And to capture carbon dioxide, you have to separate it from many other gases, including water. Now, under normal circumstances, water would kick out carbon dioxide because water likes to stick to everything. So, it's so, so the power of this chemistry is that you can go in and modify the interior of the pore, in this case with a primary amine that attracts, basically targets the CO2, binds the CO2, and fills up the pore. So this is a very important way to separate carbon dioxide from combustion gas and avoid using the current technology that's being uh, contemplated, which is these uh, toxic aqueous amine solutions. So the fact that the MOF is a solid allows you to not just design these sites onto which CO2 can bind, but also allows you to remove the carbon dioxide later without applying too much uh, energy to, to, um, for the evolution of CO2, since the solid has much lower heat capacity than water. So here's a test where we take a MOF, fill it up in a column, and then expose it to a wave of gases that includes CO2, nitrogen, water. And out on the other side, you see they only have nitrogen and water. And this is the actual data. You can see here that without that specific functionalized MOF, yet um, the efficiency of the material will go down in the presence of water. But with the functionality I showed you, the amine functionality, you can see with the water, uh, with the water and without the water, you have the same performance. So what I'm trying to say is that the basic science of capturing carbon dioxide from flue gas from power plant, from combustion gases, is solved. The, what remains is obviously to, to think about the scale up and the economics of this, of this process, making it, making it more efficient. But we have figured out how to make this very difficult separation work uh, by the MOF and by the functionalized MOF. Well, the reason this is an exciting area for me and many people around the world is that it's infinite chemistry. Think about this. You have inorganic chemistry at your disposal and organic chemistry. So conservatively, I'm going to say you have 1,000 building units from inorganic. They're only oxides, let's say. So that's really a, an underestimate. And you have a million organic units. And not just that but you also have a thousand, at least a thousand different ways of functionalizing the pores. Much more than that, but I'm just being conservative here. A thousand ways of adding side chains to those organic units I just showed you. And then you have a thousand different ways of arranging those side chains in the MOF. Much more than that. 
This is truly infinite chemistry. And so that's what I mean by new chemistry, new materials, and a new solution. So I want to illustrate the importance of the availability of these materials in solving a, a real uh, important problem, which is the lack of water. So this is an aridity map of the world. And you can see the areas that are in red, they're called water stressed. They either don't have water or they're using a lot more water than they can replenish the water in those, in those locales. Many regions that are watered um, have water, but it's, most of the time it's not clean water. So almost one third of the world lives in stressed water regions. And in 2050, that's going to go up to almost 50% of the world will have no access to clean water and will be in stressed regions of the world. This, of course, this problem is exasperated by the, the, climate, the climate change problems. Fortunately, there is a solution, and that is that there's so much water in the atmosphere. So there is uh, three sextillion liters of water in the air at any one time. That's a lot of water. That's as much water as we have in lakes and rivers on our planet. So if you can find a way of capturing that water, especially from low humidity, then perhaps we can deliver water to regions of the world where there is not much water. So while we are studying the problem of carbon capture, we discovered, and we were looking at, of course, how the interaction of water with the moth works, because we want to separate the CO2 from water. We discovered this. We discovered, this is the first moth we discovered that takes up water. You see here in the red line, this is water uptake at around 20% relative humidity. Okay, So as soon as we hit this low humidity, it looks like the material just sucked the water out of the air. There is no material out there that can do this. Absolutely none that can take up water at such low humidity. Certainly, clays and zeolites can do that. But this is the second important thing that no other material can do, and that is you can remove the water very easily. At 45 degrees, you can take the water out. Okay, most materials if you, that take up water have to have very hydrophilic pores. And so you have to heat them up to 200, 300 degrees Celsius. Okay. And, and that's not a very efficient way of, of trapping water from the atmosphere and releasing it. But in this moth, you can take it up from low humidity, which is a challenge in itself, but also take it out at low temperature. And you can do this over and over again. In this experiment, we illustrated for 80 cycles without any loss of performance. Now, after the first cycle, you see there's a slight loss of performance. I'll tell you why that is shortly. When the water goes into the pore, it makes very tiny fragments of ice. It's basically water hydrogen bonded to itself and then adhering to the metal oxide unit that makes up the moth. And then after you get the seed, other water molecules come in. So it's almost, you can think of it as a cooperative phenomenon. The moth is designed from organic and inorganic. And so it modulates how tightly that water molecule can be in there. But once the water molecules come in, they form small seeds, and then these seeds attract other water molecules through hydrogen bonding. And that's the secret for the water harvesting from, from air, is that these seeds have to form before you get the performance that I just showed you, which is the sharp knee performance. So this works in the lab. So we wanted to demonstrate that it works outside the lab. So we built it with um, a group in, at MIT, we built a small device. This is a very tiny device uh, that deploys only two grams of moth. And the moth sits on the lid, on the inside lid of this box. And during the night, you open the box, you expose the moth to the air, 
water goes into the mouth, and then during the day you close the box and expose it to sunlight. And as you expose to sunlight, what happens to the interior of the box? It's heating up. As it heats up, water comes out of the mouth. You can see here small droplets at 50 degrees C, and then as you increase the temperature and time, you see that you have larger droplets. So this is exciting, because it means you have something that can take up water from very low humidity, and then take it out without much uh, um, application of, of heat, or without having to um, spend too much, too much energy for it. So it's uh, potentially, if you can take this device and um, modify, modify it so that you have now a kilogram of moth, you can design a system, and this is all Berkeley uh, system. MIT is not involved in this. Uh, so you have, in this case, you have a box sitting inside a larger box. The inside box has the moth, and the outside box just acts as a condenser. So at night, you open the outside box, air comes in, water goes into the moth, and during the day you close it, expose the sunlight, and water comes out, hits the wall, which is slightly cooler, and condenses the water, all using ambient sunlight. Okay, no other input of energy. This is the only device in the history of mankind that, is, that can trap water from low humidity and deliver water, drinking, drinking water. And it's made from two plastic boxes and, most critically, the mouth. This is what it looks like. You see here at the walls of the box, water is running and making puddles, and the students collected those and put them in vials. And one of them is gonna drink the water to show. <laughs> All right, ready, two, three, action. Cheers. Nice. Okay. In the lab, we tested the water. There is absolutely uh, no metal or organic contamination in the water. This is a distilled water. It's ultra pure. Uh, Eugene is, uh, is part of a startup that is now um, focusing on commercializing this, uh, this technology. Now, the nice thing about moth is that the one I just showed you is a zirconium moth, and zirconium is expensive, okay? So the nice thing about this reticular chemistry is that you can go to a cheaper metal and make a different moth that even works much better than the zirconium moth. That's the power of knowing how to tweak atoms and molecules precisely and turn them to your will. So this moth, moth 303, does even better. And so we took this to the Mojave Desert. Okay, and uh, well, I want you to focus on the temperature. This is the humidity during the experiment, and this is the amount of water that has been harvested. The first run was the water that was in Berkeley which was more humid than the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert is, is the driest desert of northern uh, uh, North America. But you see here, the amazing thing is that even when the humidity in the desert went down to 7%, we were still harvesting water, okay? So the moth works at high humidity and at intermediate humidity and, most critically, at low humidity. So I told them not to come back without a video of the water that was being collected. You should see the water dripping. So from this experiment, for each kilogram of moth, 
you can harvest about one liter of water at a relative humidity of 5 to 35 uh, during the day around 5, 7%, and during the night, 35%, okay? Now, many of you may say, you know what, one, ki one liter of water, one kilogram of moff, that's not a lot. And uh, to me, it's a lot. If you are from regions where there isn't water, one liter is a lot. But also, if you want 100 liters, then you just use 100 kilos. Or you can go down and dig deep into the chemistry and recognize that the moth not only takes up the water and releases it at under mild conditions, but it also does so in a very rapid way. Okay, so the water that goes in can leave extremely fast. So that means if I have a minimal energy input like a solar panel, I can do many, many cycles during the day. And so that's the basis of the company that we have created as part of the Berkeley Catalyst Fund. You can now have a device that's not much bigger than my computer base, basically, just a small microwave that would deliver eight liters per day. And if you go to something as large as a small refrigerator, cubic refrigerator, dormitory refrigerator, you can deliver 260 liters per day. Why? Because we have the kinetics is fast, and we have a way of exposing all the moth to the air to maximize trapping the water and delivering uh, water. So uh, in a year time, we think we can get to 22,000 liters per day. So what have we done? With water harvesting from air, we've created mobile water off-grid. We made it personalized and achieved the idea of water being a human right. And this is ultra-pure water. You can use it for agriculture, for your kitchen, for any kind of use. Thank you very much.